Hi, everyone. A warm welcome to the webinar involving refugees and migrants in integration activities. The number of people who have moved to the Nordic countries is increasing and our societies have become more diverse. Making sure the newly arrived and minority groups find a home and become included in our Nordic societies is one of the key challenges in the Nordics and something we have been engaged in here at the Nordic Council of Ministers. It is something that is a priority all over the region. Yet, the authorities and organizations working with integration do not really reflect this diversity. So today we want to discuss and inspire to actively involve refugees and migrants in the integration activities. Why it is important and perhaps some ideas on how to do it. And we do have a lot to do in this field. So we are looking forward to an hour and 15 minutes of interesting new knowledge and new insights and discussion. There are more than 400 people registered for this event from all over the Nordics and Baltics, which we are really happy about, but also from countries such as Albania, the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Slovakia, Switzerland, and even Canada. So great to have you all with us. My name is Kaisa Kepsu, and I am a senior advisor here at the Nordic Welfare Center in Helsinki, Finland, and I am your moderator today. I have also had the pleasure to be involved in the Nordic Cooperation Program on Integration in the last year and a half. In a bit, my colleague Anna Maria Musekilde will say a few words about our work, uh, but first, a few practical things. Uh, your cameras and sound, they are turned off automatically, so it's okay for you to sip your coffee loudly or wear your pajamas, we won't know. Uh, the webinar will be live captioned in English from our amazing live interpreters. If you have difficulty in hearing or just want to have a text, to access the captions, click, click on the link that is posted in the chat. Uh, the captions will open into another window and you can then arrange the windows um, side by side. Uh, so yes, there is the chat. Uh, Anna Maria will be there to moderate it and uh, post links to the reports and websites that we are mentioning. Uh, please ask questions and comment, give, give comments and be active in the chat. And if possible, we will direct your questions to the speakers. And of course, you can share comments, links, and knowledge amongst each other there. I also want to mention my colleague Kasper, who is one mastermind behind this webinar and is working hard to make this event run smoothly. Uh, let us know in the chat if you have any technical problems. A few words about our program for today. In the first part of about 50 minutes, we will hear two Nordic presentations with new knowledge and insights on the topic. And in the second part, we will have a short panel discussion with three experts giving their comments. If we have time in the slots between, we will have small discussions and possibly ask some of your questions. I also want to mention that the material uh, to the presentations and a link to the recorded event will be sent out to you uh, probably next week, perhaps earlier. So now I will give the floor to my colleague Anna Maria Musekilde from the Nordic Council of Ministers in Copenhagen. We have had the great pleasure of working together with this program. So Anna Maria, please. Thank you so much, Kaisa. And also a very warm welcome to our, our webinar here from the Nordic Council of Ministers Secretariat in Copenhagen. I'm very happy to co-host uh, this webinar with the Kaisa and the Nordic Welfare Center and also to welcome today's presenters and panelists who have generously accepted to share knowledge and advice on what works in terms of outreach and involvement of refugees and migrants. The occasion of the webinar is the publication of results from two projects funded by our funding pool. 
The funding pool is earmarked for projects on integration of refugees and migrants in the Nordic countries with the aim to develop new methods and knowledge on integration. And I would like to just give a brief introduction to our work as the backdrop of today's thematic focus on inclusion. The Nordic Cooperation Program was established in 2016 by the Nordic Cooperation Ministers with the aim to share experience on what works in terms of integration. The program relates to a shared Nordic priority on developing a socially sustainable Nordic region. And related to this priority is a thematic focus on maintaining trust and cohesion in the Nordic region. There's an emphasis on democracy, gender equality, inclusion, non-discrimination, and freedom of expression. The projects uh, presented today reconfirm the necessity to involve migrants and refugees at all levels to have a better understanding of what makes inclusive societies and thereby also a socially sustainable region. At the Nordic level, the Nordic Migrant Expert Forum has been established to assure diversity of thought and inclusion at the program and policy level. The Nordic Migrant Expert Forum is represented today with two panelists and are also joined by the UNHCR to present their perspective on what makes inclusive organizations and societies. And last but not least, I would like to use this opportunity to announce that this week we have um, announced a new call for funding of projects related to integration in the Nordics, and I will share the link in the chat, and I hope you will visit the link and, and uh, possibly send us um, some project applications. But now to the most important part of today's webinar, the presentations by Rambel and Derek Russ, and discussions by our invited experts. So back to you, Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. So let's move on to the new knowledge part. Uh, we will hear about an interesting project from the aftermath of the COVID-19 pand pandemic, focusing on crisis communication to uh, targeting ethnic minorities. And I will give the floor now to Michelle Haugegaard Hörluk from Rambel in Denmark. The screen is yours, Michelle. Thank you very much, Kaisa, and uh, thank you for having me and for inviting Rampel to this webinar. I will uh, just share my screen with you uh, in one second. Great, Michelle. And while Michelle is sharing the screen, I want to remind you that if you want captions, uh, the link is shared in the chat on how to turn on the automatic captions. Yes, you should be able to uh, see it now. Um, just a brief introduction to who I am. I'm a consultant in Rampel and uh, I have been involved in uh, two projects in collaboration with uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers, focusing on crisis communication and communication in general, targeting ethnic minorities or vulnerable uh, groups in society in, in general. I will uh, walk you through uh, the two projects. And first of all, I will talk a bit about the background and the context of what we have been looking into and what the specific needs and attention points were uh, looking into uh, how to communicate to vulnerable, vulnerable groups uh, during times of crisis. We have been looking at COVID-19 as a specific case, uh, but we are, um, I think it's, a, it's safe to say that, that many of these findings and, and the tools and, and methods that I will present to you later can also be transferred to other times of, of crisis. Uh, as mentioned, we have two projects and I will introduce you uh, briefly to these two projects. I will not be able to go very much into detail with, uh, with these, uh, but you're more than welcome to reach out to me, uh, ask any questions uh, here or, or in the coming days if you have anything. I will also bring forward a couple of examples from the Nordic countries on uh, collaboration models and communication tools used specifically during the COVID-19 crisis, but uh, examples that can also be transferred um, and be relevant uh, when other crises hits. Yes, uh, we have been looking into what happens uh, in society during a crisis 
and how do the public authorities react to this? So uh, our specific case was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And as this emerged, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of dis disruption of status quo in society. What became uh, clear to public authorities was that uh, the traditional methods and, and the, the ways of communicating to the public was uh, disrupted in many ways. Um, both uh, because you need to reach a very diverse pool of people who have very specific and very different needs. Um, if you want to reach uh, vulnerable groups in society and ethnic minorities, as we're focusing on here, you have various challenges that emerge. You have language barriers, you have cultural differences, you have religion, you have some symbols that mean different things to different people, and you need to be aware of all of this. So, um, yeah, so after uh, or during our two projects, we have been talking to public uh, authorities, we have been talking to uh, civil society organizations, and we have been talking to representatives from the target group. And what is uh, most important, and what we want to, I want to highlight uh, at this webinar today is that overcoming language barriers and cultural differences, and really understanding the needs of the target group is essential uh, when communicating in times of crisis and reaching vulnerable groups in society. Uh, we know from, from communication theories that understanding the target group is, of course, always important and relevant, but, but it's important to highlight here that when you have a crisis that emerges, you have so many uncertainties that come up and you have so many changes um, in the situation all the time, and you have to really understand uh, who you are talking to, and you have to also understand that the vulnerable groups in society, for example, if you want to target immigrants or if you want to target ethnic minorities, this is not a homogeneous group. You have to really consider the differences between them and be able to target them focusing on their specific needs. Co-creation and trust building is also a very important thing uh, to having in mind. Uh, this is something that public authorities and civil society groups can actually create together. And it's an important and very essential tool uh, for reaching this target group. Um, it became evident during uh, the COVID-19 crisis that public authorities in many situations were not able to reach the target group. There were perhaps misunderstandings, but there were also um, traditional ways of communicating that were not useful uh, when focusing on this target group. And for that, civil society could play a very essential and very important role. It's also very important to prepare uh, for times of crisis before the crisis hits. Um, you need to have a predefined communication plan and you need to have a strategy for what to do when a crisis hits. This uh, was very clear uh, to public authorities uh, during the COVID-19 crisis as they had to um, establish networks and reach out to people and, and uh, formulate the strategy along the way. And when this happens, you actually lose a very critical time and you uh, miss out on a lot of opportunities if you haven't predefined this ahead of a crisis. It's also important to expand the communication toolbox that you usually work with. You have to, now I'm using the word daring, but I think it's important to really step out of, of the comfort zone and, and thinking differently of what communication tools and what methods work. You have to look at different types of channels, different types of, of communication products when you want to reach a target group that is perhaps not a, um, um, part of the majority of the population and doesn't look uh, exactly like you. Yes. So as mentioned before, we uh, have been working on two projects together with the Nordic Council of Ministers. The first project is called Outreach and Dissemination of Public Information to Immigrants During the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is a report that you can read and I, I believe Anna-Maria will share the link 
uh, with you as well. And this contains um, overall recommendations for policy and practice uh, that public sector actors can use uh, when establishing and, and formulating communication strategies to reach vulnerable groups in society. We also have another project, which is a more of a, a practical guide uh, explaining how uh, you can um, communicate more concretely. So this will be examples of tools uh, and, um, and guidelines and steps for how to actually formulate your communication strategy and how to involve civil society actors and the target group along the way. Good. The first project contains uh, recommendations for disseminating public information to immigrants, ethnic minorities, vulnerable groups in society. Um, and it's important to say here that, that uh, these recommendations can also be used not only for crisis communication, but also for communication in general. So we have divided a uh, crisis communication into three phases. The first phase is the continuous development of strategy and a collaboration forum. And this is a communication in general, and this is something that needs to be going on on a continuous basis, also when the crisis is not emerging. Then we have the activation phase, which is when a crisis emerges and you need to activate what you have already prepared. So you need to, in the continuous development of, of your strategy, to have an established team who's responsible for this type of work. You need to have established contact and network with civil society. And this is something that you can then activate in this activation phase. Then we have the launch, and this is where you uh, spread uh, and send out your communication products and you receive feedback from the target group. Uh, I want to highlight that this uh, model is, of course, based on experiences uh, from uh, uh, the Nordic countries in the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's uh, based mainly on the challenges and learnings from public authorities and civil society organizations that we have talked to. Um, these overall recommendations are then supported by this practical guide that we have also developed together with the Nordic Council of Ministers. I want to just briefly show you uh, these recommendations. I won't be able to go into detail with these, uh, but I encourage you to, to read them. Uh, and you're more than welcome to reach out and, and we can have a talk about this if you have any questions. But just to give an overall very brief uh, explanation. You have uh, the establishment of a strategy, a responsible team, a team that is diverse and that can also represent and meet the target group um, where they are. And then you have the activation where you intensify your work and you increase the amount of meetings that you have with civil society organizations and other relevant actors. And then you have the launch. This is where you send out your communication products. And this is where you have to consider which channels to use. You have to be aware of how you translate your, your materials, what symbols, what visualizations you're using. Uh, so that's what the launching phase is about. Then we have the practical guide, which is uh, much more concrete on then how do you actually do this? So the guide contains a uh, various um, um, uh, tips and tricks uh, on, on how to approach communication, but you can also go in and actually take out some of these tools and use them in, in, your, uh, in your work. So we have, for example, here, uh, what you can see is um, just um, a, a very um, uh, an illustration of what, uh, what um, a network meeting could look like and how to structure that when you meet with uh, civil society organizations. Then we have this communication wheel that highlights the different types of, of communication and the different purposes that you have with communication products. So you have visibility, you have knowledge and you have action. And I'm very sorry that uh, for this being in, in Danish, um, um, but uh, yeah, the guide is unfortunately only in Danish for now. We also have various checklists. For example, this one is how to map uh, the different channels used by your target group and how to make sure that you also select the correct 
channels that will actually reach the target group that you want to reach. Yeah, uh, this, uh, this practical guide is applicable to all three phases that I just uh, presented to you before. And this uh, content is also built on learnings and best practice um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Good. I'm not sure about uh, the time, Kaiser, but uh, you can interrupt me if I'm uh, running over time. You are not running over time, Michelle. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Then I, I have time to also uh, talk to you about these uh, two cases that I want to highlight. So now I've been talking more uh, overall about recommendations, guidelines, and, and how to communicate to the target group. But I'm sure that many of you then think, okay, but what does it look like? And, and, and how, what are you even basing this on? So we have been talking to public authorities, civil society organizations, and representatives from the target group to actually be able to understand, okay, so how does this work in practice? And what have you been doing specifically to reach uh, the target group during the COVID-19 pandemic? So the first example that I want to highlight for you is uh, the Corona Guide program in uh, Aarhus Municipality in Denmark, which is the second largest city in Denmark. And this is about co-creation and collaboration with civil society and target group rep representatives. Um, what they did in the municipality was to uh, reach out to their contact points uh, in the local community and uh, gaining or establishing a network with civil society organizations and also uh, gathering a group of representatives from the target group. Um, they, this was a very um, ad hoc and very ongoing process. So it wasn't an established uh, collaboration model in the beginning. Uh, however, it, it, it kind of became that in the end. So it started out uh, with, uh, with um, the municipality reaching out to representatives from the target group and civil society organizations to understand how do we actually uh, get this very important uh, information across uh, to make sure that we avoid any uh, increased risks in, uh, in the areas of our city that we know are more uh, at risk and more vulnerable to these health um, health issues. So that's what they did more specifically. They uh, had online meetings um, with these people and they um, established an, a training or an education system for representatives from the target group to, to, to teach them and train them in how to, to communicate to people in their local community and how to spread uh, information. So um, this became a, a solution for this munis municipality to, to actually overcome some of these language barriers and to strengthen their own cultural understanding. So if you don't speak the language of the people that you want to reach and you don't understand their, not only their their interpretation in terms of language, but also the cultural interpretation of the communication materials, you are lost soul. So, so you really need to have representatives that can provide you with ongoing feedback so that you can continuously um, match the needs of the target group. You need people who speak the language and who understand the culture. Good. Uh, this became an effective tool, not only for the pandemic, but also something that I know the municipality will be using uh, moving forward. Good. Uh, I don't know if we have time for another case or if we should uh, save that for another time. Uh, we will also send out the, the, the link. So, so I think uh, you could um, finish off by now Good. because I have a few questions for you, Michelle. Yes. Uh, I think this was really really interesting and I thank you very much for this and I, I can just mention here that Anna Maria has posted the link to the guide and uh, like Michelle said for now it's only available in Danish but there is a summary in English there. Yes and the report should be in English. Yes that's right. Uh, what I'm thinking about you can stop sharing uh, Michelle so we can see you on screen here as well and I also want to um, encourage uh, you in the 
in the audience to post questions if you have just general uh, thoughts about the theme or 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 want to ask any questions now the chat should be open we had a few problems there in at first but michelle i'm wondering how did you in this work that you did uh how did you involved uh, involve the target group mm -hmm. in this can you tell a little bit more about that what was the response among representative yeah. of ethnic minorities yeah yeah that's a really good question i think it's a you have to uh, <laughs> live live by your own example so of course we needed to also uh, talk to both civil society organizations but also the target group ourselves um uh, we had uh, interviews with uh, with representatives from the target groups um, uh, to understand how was this communication received. So we wanted to know, okay, so how do you actually receive all of these? There's a lot of effort going on. Or there's a lot of good intentions, but how do you actually understand this? So we invited for focus groups and interviews uh, with with the representatives from the target group. And this can, of course, uh, be a challenge because for us as, as well, there's a language and, and cultural uh, uh, barriers that we need to overcome. Uh, but there's, there's ways uh, of doing that. Uh, luckily, we have colleagues ourselves who speak different languages, but we also have access to, to translators. So, um, so that's, of course, a, a way of overcoming that barrier. Uh, what we also did was to to uh, use uh, civil society organizations ourselves and to have them help us also uh, asking uh, representatives from the target group, but also to reaching them so that we could ask them questions. Yeah, well, what was the response among this group when you yeah. involved, involved yeah. representative? Yeah, I think uh, of course, uh, we had a lot of different cases uh, and a lot of different examples of initiatives and and it, it really depends uh, but i think uh, if you want to highlight uh, some of the some of the similarities i think the most important thing is to actually feel that you are being heard so the the best examples are when when uh, when the people who send out communication also ask the target group for feedback on what to improve. So, so if you send out a poster, for example, you could also afterwards try to figure out, okay, how was this poster actually received? And this is something that uh, from, from talking to representatives from the target group, that it's something that's really valued because you feel heard and you can actually mm -hmm. help uh, shape the communication yourself. So, um, so that that's something that is very positive. I think uh, examples of when it can go wrong is when, if you use a symbol that's understood uh, differently uh, across cultures, uh, that can be a problem. Colors could also uh, become an issue. And then uh, another example, which was um, uh, in the in the bad category, is when you have too much text. So mm. you really have to prioritize uh, and summarize just the main points instead of focusing on, for example, translating huge amounts of, of, uh, of uh, texts and pages from the national mm. authorities, you have to prioritize among the most important mm. messages. Yes. Well, great. Thanks a lot, Michelle. And uh, please um, look up these uh, two reports, the, guide, the more practical guide and the other English speaking uh, reports that you have you are being sent links to so thank you Michelle and uh, let's move on uh, to uh, uh, we will move on to the Nordic Red Cross Network and I will ask uh, Mats uh, Vestergaard to turn on his camera and also Nila Helgadotir we can see you right now as well welcome you will share some findings from your work together. You have had professional, discu professional discussions on the Nordic level between, between uh, Red Cross, um, uh, the Red Crosses in, uh, in uh, the Nordic countries. So welcome both of you. And first I will give the floor to Mats here. Thank you, Kaiser. Um, and I'll just uh, take a moment to share my screen. Yes, and while you do, please feel free to send questions and comments in the chat. 
Yes. Well, thank you for um, for the opportunity for us to to present at this uh, this webinar, and also thank you for um, for putting um, the issue of involvement on the agenda um, because it is quite important, uh, but uh, for several reasons also difficult. Um, in our presentation, um, I will um, start off by uh, saying a few words about the Nordic uh, network uh, between the Red Cross societies. Um, so we know where we, so you know uh, where we're talking from. I'll say a few words about the report. And uh, finally, we'll dive more into this issue of involvement, where, which is an important part of, of the report. Um, and then finally, Nina will, will end our presentation by um, presenting a handful of, of practice recommendations. Um, so, um, why is a Nordic Red Cross integration network a good thing? Um, the, all Red Cross societies in the North um, have played an active role in the reception and the integration of um, uh, refugees and other migrants, um, as we've most recently seen um, with the Ukrainian refugees. So there's a lot of uh, experience in uh, the five countries and also um, a Nordic network makes sense because as they would say in Thailand it's same same but different um, we uh, have a lot of similarities uh, both societal and organizational um, similar welfare societies the Red Cross play uh, a similar role in those societies and we are the same organization um, in all the countries built on the same seven principles, but there are also variations, both societal and organizational. So um, one could say that there's a, a very good balance that, that creates a great potential for learning and actual transfer of, of ideas between the national contexts. Um, so with, with funds from the, the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, we've established um, a quite new, but already strong network, I would say, um, where we can inspire, challenge, and improve our work and organizations within this field of integration and, and social inclusion of, um, of migrants and minorities. We, can, um, we have a place where we can exchange practical knowledge and experiences, um, a place where we can um, undertake joint ventures and projects. One day we haven't done that yet, but it's, uh, it's definitely an option. And we have a forum where we can have professional discussions about uh, integration and social inclusion. Um, so that, in short, is, is the network, and that's where we're talking from. Um, the report that we put out recently uh, is um, a concrete output from, um, from our professional discussions so far. Um, in the report, we, we present four key issues that, that we identified as being important to address across the Nordic countries um, if we want to bolster the work we do with um, integration and social inclusion. The target group of the report is actually um, ourselves, it's the Red Cross societies in the North, but, but we hope that it can be of interest to others. Um, um, we'll probably know by the end of this seminar if, if we are correct on that, but um, that's um, that's what we hope for as well. And, and what we wish to do is to create some change and to stir a little in our own organizations um, regarding these issues. Um, but also we see it as a contribution to a wider discussion on, on some quite complex matters. Um, so we, um, we don't have the answers to these questions, but, um, but, um, but, but we also and and we also point to, to difficulties and uh, in that way it's, it's quite a I would say an honest contribution to that discussion um, because even though we believe that we actually do a lot of good work in this area across the five countries we we also point to to areas where we can probably be, oh not probably but for sure do better um, and finally it's important for me to say that that we just heard a, a research um, or a, a survey based uh, report from from rumble and and this is not a research project it's it's not a, an official position of the red cross it's more of a, a practitioner's uh, perspective 
And in the report, we identified these four key issues that, um, that we believe are important. The first is the active involvement of the target group. We can come back to that. The next is that um, our organization should reflect the diversity of our societies. Um, as Kaiser mentioned, uh, we are quite homogenous also in the Red Cross, um, both among staff and volunteers. Um, we should be more diverse, and this relates to, to the first issue of involvement as well. Um, we should, um, we argue in the report that it's important to, to um, work on the basis of, of neutral needs assessment of the people uh, we work with. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're a refugee from Ukraine or Syria, you should actually be helped in the same way according to, to the needs you have. And finally, um, and that's an old classic, I guess, cross-sector cooperation. Um, it sounds easy and obvious, but it, it takes uh, some effort to actually be great and to uh, fulfill the full potential of that. And we point to, to some um, aspects of that in the report as well. And finally, we, we address uh, sort of an, an additional issue where we only scratch the surface, and, and that's the issue of, of language and terminology, uh, what we actually call our target group. Um, do we call them participants or migrants or refugees or um, young men or women, or what do we call them, um, the people we work with? Uh, it's of importance and um, it's a very interesting discussion and we want to, to sort of um, dive more into that uh, in the network. Um, yes, so now on to, to, to the issue of uh, active involvement. Um, there are many reasons why it's important. Um, and, and, and these are some of the, the reasons that, that we talked about in the group that, that if you involve those you want to help or those you want to create a change for and with, then uh, you actually get a better understanding of the needs that needs um, to be addressed. You also get a better understanding of the context that the people live in. Um, and thereby you actually get a better chance of addressing the right needs in the right way. And, and that in turn creates better and more sustainable programs. It will also increase individual and community empowerment uh, if you involve people. And as organizations always looking for, for volunteer uh, manpower, um, this can also be um, um, an opportunity for us to access new human resources when we turn um, recipients of help or beneficiaries into volunteers themselves. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and then finally, um, as Michelle mentioned, there's the issue of trust that if we involve people, then we increase the, the trust and, and legitimacy, legitimacy among migrant communities. Um, and that actually goes beyond the individual programs where we do this because it affects the whole organization. Um, Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are some of the reasons uh, we identified as making this important. So the obvious question is, um, if there are these many benefits, um, and it's, it's it's something that that we all want to do, apparently, um, why don't we do it more? Um, and um, in order to answer that, we, we, we looked at some of the stumble blocks or obstacles um, that, um, that could hinder this. And, and the first is that language differences is actually a real, um, a real challenge. Um, it, um, it makes it difficult to create a mutual understanding um, in the projects and, and when you meet people and, and it can limit a nuanced communication when you go through, um, through a, a, an interpreter or through uh, Google Translate or the like. Uh, secondly, um, and this is actually on a quite fundamental level that, that we as people and organization fail to be open to new perspectives when they, when they don't correspond with our underlying values and beliefs um, and the way we normally do things. Um, and quite often these values um, are on a sort of a, a fundamental level that we might not be aware of ourselves, but that, that can put a limit to involving uh, people who might present um, things or go to uh, go about things in a different way. Um, it actually takes time and resources to involve um, and it can seem easier and might even tempting 
um, in the short term not to involve. Um, and it also can challenge the self-perception of volunteers because it, it changes the, the power dynamics uh, between the givers and the receivers of help. Um, and finally, um, and this is something that we, we see lacking somewhere, but it's, it's all, all, also there as well. Uh, it's, it's quite a nuanced uh, picture here, but when there is a lack of organizational commitment and allocation of, of the necessary times, uh, time and resources, as I mentioned, then it's difficult. Then it's difficult to do this in practice. Um, so yeah, these are some of the some of the the, the challenges that we identified uh, that might uh, be in our way um, when we want to do this. Um, yep, and um, now over to Nina. Uh, good morning, and thank you uh, for inviting us. Um, I will continue with the with the. Uh, final uh, slide of uh, our presentation. Uh, these are the recommendations that we came up with: how to how to involve actively, uh, and we felt that that were relevant for the respective Red Crosses in the Nor Nordic countries. And as Matt said before, this is not an outcome of scientific research, but the outcome of discussion of the network on the prerequisite to be able to realize involvement and be able to do proper inclusion work uh, within the communities. This is not to say that uh, work on involvement is not taking place within the Red Cross. There are some very good things and very good uh, projects and, and uh, efforts being done, but it's still not a good sign that we haven't progressed uh, further uh, on involvement when we have talked about it for so many years in, in different organizations and, and institutions. Um, but we have, as said, we have identified these different aspects of uh, being of importance when we want to be better at including our target group. So to start with, uh, make involvement a strategic uh, priority or a political decisions, decision within the organization. And there has to be commitment, both from management and in case of an NGO, also from the governance. And this should be stated in the organization's uh, oral policy. Secondly, we need to make it mainstream. Uh, possibly we need to make a cultural uh, change and make it mandatory. And um, the importance of involvement should be stated by management as the way forward and thoroughly anchored in, in all the work and programs at all levels. And needs to be decided on how we are going to go forward with it in different corners of our work. Thirdly, uh, we need to make the benefits of actual involvement very clear that it actually leads to better programs, more sustainability, and this is not a question of just being politically correct. Everyone needs to be aware of the benefit of involvement. Uh, and as Kaiser said uh, before, our communities are becoming more diverse and complex, and that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, and that with their involvement, our programs uh, will improve. Fourthly, uh, we need to invest in organizational capacity building and know-how regarding how to involve the target group. And this can take time and resources, but the outcome will definitely be better and more relevant work. So it definitely pays off. Uh, and when it comes to uh, involvement, uh, it's often in the implementation phase that it's already being done but we feel that we need to look at it more broadly. And therefore we stress that it's taking place already in the needs assessment, in project design, in implementation, and also evaluation and, and feedback back uh, to the community. And as you can see, um, we're running out of time, so I'm uh, finishing up. As you can see, this is not a, a, an exact toolbox on how to 
implemented the involvement of the target group and this is not like any any five easy steps to do. Uh, and we have already plenty of toolboxes out there uh, that access from research within the Red Cross itself, in other organizations, think tanks, etc. But these are more prerequisites for taking those toolboxes into use. So this is a, a, the, the basic uh, aspects of the work that we feel is, is of importance. So thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much, Nina and Mats. Uh, seems like you have had a lot of discussions and, and uh, exchange of knowledge, and I think you are very clear on, on the issue of involvement. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, if I can ask, uh, you discussed a lot between the different Nordic countries. Can you Do you have any um, thoughts about, um, or did you notice anything interesting when it comes to differences between the Nordic countries? Or, or uh, to rephrase, was there anything particularly surprising or interesting uh, when you worked together in this Nordic network that came up? Um, well, I, I can start to answer that. Um, th there's no easy answer to it because, um, but but one answer could be that that it was interesting to see that we all uh, struggled with the same issues. Mm. Um, there was a lot of resonance when someone explained what they're working with, and and we could see that. Um, actually uh, went for all the societies so so that was interesting to see um, um yeah yeah and there was common ground in in what to do with it but there also differences in 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 how to how to work with it um in some countries there was more uh, specific uh, uh integration programs uh, in other um in other countries the word integration is not really used um the 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 the, um, the target groups are more um, um, are framed differently or spoken about differently um, mm. in the different countries. Yeah, and yeah. there were and also di different different efforts or different uh, uh, um, yeah different efforts being done at different levels in some national societies. There were like. They had good uh, practical guidelines at the program level and some uh, national society, they had a very clear um, line forward with involvement in the in the national policy. So it, it depends on, on, but interesting examples uh, that were available from, from the different countries, from different uh, corners of, of the work. Yeah, and I suggest all of you have a look at this report as well. And I mean, there is so much we could talk about uh, just regarding uh, the fact you might Mats mention mentioned about the labeling and the, the fact that should we call it, should we use the word term integration and so on. But I guess that would be kind of uh, going into really deep waters right now. So at this moment, uh, I will thank you so much for your for your presentation and, and sharing this with us. And uh, we can move on to the panel discussion now. Thank you, Mats, and thank well, you, thank Nina. You. And thank you for listening. Okay, now uh, let's invite uh, three experts on integration to the screen to hear their perspectives on how we are doing in the Nordic countries when it comes to involving the target group. So I see Asim is here, uh, Ruth and Carolis, we are expecting. Great to have you here. Um, and uh, let me introduce uh, these prominent guests and we will have a possibility to discuss this matter and hear, uh, hear some thoughts also, uh, perhaps on the work that lies ahead of us. So first we have two members of the Nordic Migrants Expert Forum that Anna Maria mentioned here in the start. It's an advisory forum for the Nordic Council of Ministers and works as a bridge between the needs of refugees and immigrants and, and the initiatives of public authorities. 
uh, we have uh, Asim Latif, who is head of development at the Foundation for Social Responsibility in Denmark. It's a non-profit organization that has developed a broad set of initiatives to promote better integration, um, such as BABA, which is using the fathers as resources and and a quite well-known initiative called the Neighborhood Mothers that is also applied in other countries. Uh, then I want to welcome Ruth Montgomery Anderson from Greenland. Uh, she has worked as a midwife, a cultural activist and researchers with topics such as health disparities and health promotion. And uh, finally, uh, we have Karolis Chibas, um, Carlis is an integration officer at UNHCR, uh, the UN F Refugee Agency, and he works at the representation for the Nordic and Baltic countries in Stockholm. So if uh, welcome once more, and if we start Asim with you with quite an open ended question, uh, what are your reflections on what you have heard today on this topic? What's the situation like in your experience. I mean, I guess this is not the first time this issue has been raised. No, this is not definitely not the first time the issue has been raised. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's actually quite tough uh, topic to, to comment because I've been working within this social field for about 15 years professionally and as a volunteer for almost 25 years. So it's a it's a it's it's a field where I have in depth knowledge of both uh, the the various organizations, their dynamics, and uh, and uh, and and the, the yeah the relation with the minorities in Denmark, <clears throat> and it's a, a Danish uh, insight I have. Um, so basically. What I've heard today is beautiful. It's beautiful music. Uh, for 15 years ago, I heard the same things. Uh, and, uh, and at that time, uh, we used to be very, uh, you know, uh, we were, yeah, uh, very uh, emotionally, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it captured our emotions it, it, because we, um, we thought that it was a recognition of us minorities as uh, individuals. But the th sad thing is, because I don't know whether I should, you know, kneel down, I should cry, I should, you know, rage. I, I'm quite frustrated because it stays at this level. It stays, uh, it's, it's a quite privileged um, uh, attitude because uh, it, these organizations, uh, uh, these uh, activists, they can, um, they're right with everything they say. And why are these things not happening? Because, uh, and, and, uh, and I think that's because of a, a privileged uh, attitude because they don't go to bed with that same thing. You know, it's an intellectual talk, you have it, you feel it, and then you go home. Right, and then, but we have kids, we have uh, everybody else, we have people who are ill, we have people who have mental issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these NGOs working with ethnic minorities or health sector, etc., are looked upon from a minority perspective, ethnic minority perspective, and in a Danish uh, perspective as organizations which are only for white. I mean, I'll just say it as it is, and I say it with love, with uh, with care for this sector. And I, I think uh, if we just implemented the things that just came up today in both reports, it'll be perfect. If you look at, for example, all the, if you look at the social parameters, you know, how people are doing their mental well being, their, their health uh, uh, level, all parameters, uh, ethnic minorities, they are overrepresentative, uh, overrepresented negatively, right? Uh, uh, but they don't feel that none of these organizations are there for them. Uh, how come, right? And and the organizations that work with integration issues, if you look at it, in their uh, their staff is. Uh, it's not representative of the of the group they're working with. They've been working with like 15, 20, 25 years. We have well-educated ethnic minorities today. 
were capable of uh, of holding positions, doing good stuff, uh, good job for solving the problems. They're not there. They're not. Uh, they're just not there. Um, so I, I think from intentions to actions, there's a long distance. Yeah. And even if you look at um, the health authorities uh, in COVID, uh, they rolled out all their, you know, uh, uh, the whole artillery uh, out and, you know, translated, did everything, collaborated, all that stuff. And now when the, when the pandemic is over, uh, minorities still have huge health issues, right? They're dying, they're all representative in all the statistics. But where, where is the health organization now? You know, what is the definition of crisis? Uh, they have all the tools, as I said, uh, in, in both the reports, all the tools are there, all the really, uh, experiences are there, intentions are there, but um, What's what's uh, yeah mm. what's happening that 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 there is no consistent action and there is a, a feeling of being uh, outside you know saying that this this these in these uh, activities etc are only for a specific segment of the majority in Denmark not for yeah. all ethnic minorities. Thank you, Asim. I I think you woke us all up at the latest by now so so thanks for that input ruth do do you agree on with asim uh of course <laughs> i i agree with asim and um but i think that uh, i mean i can't say it any better than he he did so uh thank you but i'd like to lock talk about how we're talking about we don't know how to get them involved. We don't know how to make people a part of uh, of this. And that's one of the things that uh, both uh, uh, I'm going to look at at the Red Cross, uh, Nina and Mess's uh, presentation. Uh, and one of the things they talked about was uh, power dynamics. And I think that that is one of the major challenges because in order, in order to actually involve people, because we're talking about how do we involve them instead of saying, how do we collaborate? And as long as you are, as long as we are involving them, then there's no collaboration. It, there is, or there might be a collaboration, but there's a power dynamics in it that is, that is unhealthy. Uh, uh, um, and when they say something, it becomes something like, well, they're talking about uh, being a, a, a minority, or this is the way the minorities perceive it, instead of saying this is another expert or another person who has a long e experience or knows something that is actually coming with a thing that doesn't only involve the fact that they are a minority. So for, for me, I think that, I think that uh, both uh, how we communicate the power dynamics and how we, uh, how we, uh, pull ourselves back and I'm saying we as like, you know, how do we pull ourselves back to give, uh, to make sure that there is agency and to make sure that things are going forward. Um, uh, one of the things that the Red Cross said also was that the last suggestions they had that were, they weren't exact, uh, they weren't real tools, but that's what I think they were. They were real tools. There was a question of ensuring uh, that, uh, you know, that us uh, as non, uh, non-immigrants, and I'm not saying us, me, but I'm just kind of saying, because this was all written from the, the perspective of us and them, mm -hmm. a lot of it. How do yeah. we involve them? How do we give them agency? How do we do this? And I think that that's one of the major challenges uh, because it's not we that are doing, it is us. Yeah. And the last thing I wanted to say, because I know that I'm getting to the point, is that you have to see people as people, their families, 
how do we involve them? How do we get them excited in see them as people, see them as families here or experts or whatever, uh, because we're all immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, or migrants or refugees. But what is it that, what is it, now I'm talking about we as, as an immigrant, as a, uh, 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 what do we come, what do we put on the table? Yeah, yeah, good points, Ruth, really good points. Thank you. Thanks a lot um, to you, Carlis. Um, what are your thoughts and uh, on, on this and how, how when you look at your own organization, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, how and what are you doing here? And if I can also add one question that came in from the chat that was really interesting. Do you think that the biggest problem is that the staff is homogenous or that the organizations fail to get the target group into the organization after an activity? Turn on the microphone, Mike, Carlos, because Thanks, we really yes. want to hear you. Thanks a lot, Kaiser, and thanks a lot, Ruth, with ASIM. I think I, I would put as every uh, my signature under every word you've said today. Um, but I, I would say that perhaps, first of all, I will use the word participation, not involvement, because I think participation as a concept and definition is much more inclusive in that sense. Uh, but also, I, I think that you know we need to understand why it, it it had happened in a way that we have a very limited participation of migrants and refugees. And I would suggest for all of us to look back at the past 50 or even more years. Uh, and what we can see there is basically that integration has always been embedded in a certain form of the power relation, as uh, has just mentioned. But I would say it's much more embedded in the systems than all, all, only in the people. So it means that either it has been interaction between minority and majority, which is a power relation, or finally, it has been embedded in uh, uh, in the relationship between the integrating institutions and those who must be integrated. And in such context, refugees and migrants, they have always been considered as a passive beneficiaries of services instead of proactive designers and co-designers of the policies that actually are, you know, are, are related to their own well-being and the destiny in their own country. And I think that the limited participation of refugees and immigrants at, at, uh, at the moment is basically the price we pay for these asymmetric power relations, yeah, where you have the integrating institution above and people who must be integrated below. And I think this, this is exactly that, that the price we pay. And I think that first of all, we would need to reconsider how we are considering the local and national level integration uh, ecosystems. And I would say that symmetric power relations is about participation. So that's the one element. And I think this is very much embedded in the, I would say in the 50s, 60s where Chicago School of Sociology has basically introduced us with the integration definition. The second part, I would say that participation should not be considered as a luxury or privilege for uh, the most capacitated and highly skilled people and refugees. It should be understood at the end of the day as a basic right for all of us, including refugees and migrants, uh, to be engaged in co-design and co-development and complementation of all the actions which concerns people's lives in the country. And this is very, very, very logical. And going beyond integration, I would say that it's not just about migrants and refugees discussing integration policies. It's about discussing the climate change, gender equality, human rights, democracy, etc. So we shouldn't just be attached to that very narrow area where the migrants and refugees should be engaged because they have much more to say about the global world and democracy than perhaps we think. And that is definitely, of course, shouldn't be a luxury for the one or the other group. And that has to be two-way process, not one-way process. The third part is very fundamental. The participation of refugees and migrants shouldn't take place only when the crisis hits. That's another issue. It has to be sustainable. It has to be self-generated. And it should be embedded in all our cultures, yeah, from the local authorities, civil society, to the academia and private sector. And I, I, I think this is this is really, really an essence. And perhaps the last thing for the first part of the discussion is that um, um, it's participation is not the language courses. It's not labor market inclusion. Yeah, participation goes beyond integration services. Participation goes towards the building the cohesive and inclusive society. And that not just helps basically decision makers to work on the evidence-based policy response, but what is very important for the refugee and for displaced people is that it promotes protection, 
uh, it reduces feeling of powerlessness. It basically helps to rebuild the self-esteem, self-confidence and cope with trauma. And that is the most important element of inclusion and integration. And at the end of the day, we're talking about the sense of belonging. And the sense of belonging will never be achieved with the language courses and vocational training and labor market inclusion. The sense of belonging will be achieved through the symmetric power relations and participation mm. without you know, us and them. So I think I will just leave it here. Yeah, wise, wise words from all of you. Thank you very much. And it seems like um, in, in one way, the pandemic was a wake up call in this issue, but it seems like, like you say, it's not just, it hasn't been sustainable uh, at all when it comes to participation. And, and, um, but if we look in the future, I mean, uh, on the ways forward, um, it doesn't look like we have come too far. Uh, so what should, what should we do? What, where, where should the focus be now in, on, on, in the coming years? Do you have any solutions or thoughts on that also, Karolis, have you have received a question here that you can think about? Do you think symmetric power relations are even possible? But yeah, I will, so, <laughs> yeah. If you thanks, want to quick, thanks, quickly uh, comment that, I think you know, I, 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 I think that there are a couple of ways forward. Yeah. So first of all, the participation—it's not a rocket science. It's quite simple, and there are many ways of, of basically doing those things. Yeah. So it's from conventional forms such as passive and, and active voting rights to. Mm to a huge variety of unconventional forms. It's national, regional, local consultative bodies, advisory boards, intercultural councils under the municipalities, like umbrella organizations, local bicycle and chess, as well as other clubs where the real integration happens. And finally, I would say the various feedback and mechanism and participatory assessments that actually we as a UN refugee agency are working. But the most important here is political will because it cannot be mm. mandated only to the civil society and the governmental sector only. It must be a priority for the national local authorities with the funding, affirmative actions, and I would say commitments. So, 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 so that's where you can actually reach to more inclusive participatory approach because symmetric power relations is basically about where we are, you know, giving the mandate of integration to those people that they should that that the policies are targeting them. So, you know, I think it's it's, it's quite logical. And if I may say that we should start from the very simple, but at the same time, complicated things, our language and the definition. To, today, we heard like, I think I heard like 10, 15 times the word target group. Yeah? So this clearly indicates the power relations, yeah, where we are thinking about a target group. So I think by changing the language, first of all, we will be able to change the public discourse around integration issues. And then what we can do, actually, we can change the culture, the participatory culture. So I think this, this is very important. And then it will help us to really critically reevaluate and reconsider existing integration ecosystems and how we can actually improve our participatory techniques. And one of the things that thanks a lot to, to you that you have shared only our UNHCR and MPG tool that we are working, I think it's very, very self-explanatory tool for the local practitioners, how you know, we can lift the thinking of participatory approaches and techniques you know, among all the local uh, local practitioners. So I think this is really, really, really important. But I think that um, even before that, we need to think about how, you know, how we're framing the language and how we're framing the public discourse. Because by using the target group, we are automatically considering that this is the one way process. Yeah, we need to reach to the target group. But what is a two-way process? What is the feedback? Where are these people? are part of the core design of all the integration ecosystem, because this is about them, not about us. So I think I will finish with our very, very, perhaps well-known simple argument is nothing uh, about us without us. So thank you. Thanks. Ruth, I will uh, give the floor to you now. Uh, where do you think we should go next? Uh, I think one of the things that we have to, uh, you said nothing about us without us. I think that one of the things that we have to uh, re remember and realize is that, that people are not sitting waiting for someone to save them. That mm -hmm. immigrants, refugees, uh, people from other 
that have other backgrounds are not sitting there passively. They are moving forward. And it's a question about whether or not society sees it and goes along with it, or if they get shocked at one point. A quick little quirk is that in the US right now, the most educated group as a whole, percentage wise, are black women. Have the highest education as you take, you take a group and you say of the percentage wise. And, and the thing about it is, is that people are, and the same thing is happening in Denmark, at least, I don't know enough about Sweden and that, that are immigrant women they are getting their educations and they are moving forward. And I think that it's so important to realize that they're not waiting for us or for, for society to give them permission to get their educations. Their families are supporting them and this is happening and things are going to, they may not change in the manner that we want and they may not change in the, the as quickly as we want, but one day, the society is going to wake up and find out that actually they have a very strong group of people who are bringing things forward. And they're not only bringing things forward within the society, they're bringing things forward within their families. They are creating spaces for themselves. Mm. And the space can either be an inclusive and everybody in the society will be allowed to be a part of it, or it will be, they will continue. So I think that that is a positive note mm -hmm. and uh, the affirmative action part would be a good idea because otherwise you're going to lose to other countries, to other places, all of these unbelievably well-educated, well-functioning, well-fundel, uh, I don't remember the word in English, uh, mm -hmm. people who are there already. Yeah. That was Thank my note. Thanks, Ruth. And uh, Asim, you will have to reply quite quickly here. If you if you have a lot of solutions, you can save them for later. But let let us hear your final comments. Well, I have tons of solutions, but I agree with what has been said. And 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 the biggest worry I have is also losing on to these very very resourceful uh, minorities we have, uh, both in recruiting to uphold the welfare societies of the Nordic countries uh, in the future, but also of retaining uh, ethnic minorities uh, in, this, uh, yeah, in these times of very scarce resources, uh, especially scarce labor force. Basically, what I would like to say is that it's about time that we recognize that every individual uh, ethnic minority has a value and worth in itself, in their own right. They're just, they're not just tokens. Uh, they're not, it's, diversity is not a buzzword only, but we really, really have to work with them. They're a member of this community. If you want a successful thriving communities, we have to have everybody with us. Therefore, first of all, our own attitude that they are just as valuable as others. They're not only valuable or important when a pandemic hits, and you and, and and they might be the root cause for spreading uh, the virus onto the majority. They're also important when they have other health issues or social issues that do not spread out to others, but only hits them. So I think we really, really have to uh, recognize there in, in our actions uh, also when there is no crisis because uh, uh, crisis we never learn from crisis is that's yeah. a, that's, that's a historical thing yeah mm. and 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 therefore we need uh, uh, we need to have more representation in uh, ngos in uh, in all different things as uh, carlis also was in and i think uh, the commitment is not uh, has to come from the funding side as well that that when the the, the donors have to uh, keep this as a requirement that it's a representative, whatever NGO they, they support uh, with their issues, because this will help on commitment if it, it has economical consequences. And then I think we should invest in relational uh, capacity building. Uh, 
as well as uh, capacity building of ethnic minority organizations. We don't have that in Denmark. We haven't had that for 10 years or something. Because when the crisis hit, they need to organize uh, or work together, have trust with minority organizations, which the government has decided not to work together with. Uh, so, so I think that, uh, that building relationship and capacity building ethnic minority organizations, as well as, as, well as uh, the Danish NGOs and, and, and diversity, uh, I think that should be the way forward. Yeah. Thank you all. I think that's a good place to stop and start wrapping up. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Ruth. And uh, thank you very much for all of the uh, audience for participating. It's been a packed hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot left to do uh, here in the Nordic countries, which is why discussion is, of course, needed, but particularly a will uh, for to to uh, to enhance the participation of refugees and immigrants. So um, let's uh, continue this, and uh, we're also glad at the Nordic Council of Ministers to have the expertise of this uh, migrant expert forum for opinion and advice, and and we have learned a lot today as well. So thank you very much, and on behalf of all of us. Thank you and have a good rest of the day.